moved into the treatment ward. That's where they uh, gave shock therapy. I waited quite a while for my turn at shock therapy. It was just after Christmas <laughs> and you got like three shock three shocks because we well, I remember the first show. During the uh, interim, I'd uh, become friends with a oh, number of patients in the mail board. It, it was good to socialize and chat with the other guys. You, you learned some things. One thing I learned was uh, there were a lot of patients there who were a lot worse off than I was. And up in the women's ward, you got to meet some of the women, and there was one young uh, woman that I took a shine to, and took a shine to me, and I remember we were dancing, and uh, I told her, I was, I'd ask the other patients about what the treatments were like. No one really liked them, but uh, they said they weren't too bad, and I told her I was going to have treatments, and she said, well, at least we'll be able to see each other because she had a lot of treatments. So they wake you early in the morning before anybody else is up for breakfast, which was the breakfast was at 7, so you were up at 6 at least. Down to the nurse's office, take your temperature, blah, 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 make sure you weren't sick. Put uh, bathroom slippers on your feet. And you walked down the hall and sat in this room and waited. And waited and waited because you were waiting while the rest were having their breakfast. And the door opened up to the women's ward, which is on the second floor. And it came to the women and they were all dressed in buttered hubbards. And I remember seeing the lady I liked. Across the way, and she looked very nervous, and I was extremely nervous. And we didn't say a word. <laughs> we didn't talk to each other. You know, it was just wait for that trip. Then they bring in the girdies, and one by one, ladies first, they got put on the girdie, wheeled into another room that you couldn't see, and then. After some time, someone would kind of stagger back into the room. And I was near the end that it laid down on the gurney and they bark it so they know who you are in case you forget. <laughs> I mean, they told us that uh, this might affect our memory a little. Go into the little room, they inject you with uh, true syrup sodium pedophile and knock you out. Before it's knocked out, the doctor asked me, he said, well, what do you think about your father? I don't know if I told him the truth or not. And I learned later from observing other people that they wheeled you around the curtain and you got hooked up for the shock and they put monitored your feet some way, which is why you had to wear them slippers. And after you blah, 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 convulsed for a bit, you know, they carried you over. They had this room with beds bucked up one against the other. And they would plop you down. And then as more patients came in, they rolled you over, moved you over and over, sort of like an assembly line. And the ones at the end, hopefully, had kind of regained consciousness and could get up in their feet. And Walk back into the same room we were waiting in, which was then set up with a table for our breakfast. Well, I remember the first treatment, and maybe the second treatment, but I had 14 treatments and I, I soon lost track of them and whatever. Treatments really put you in a fog. I could remember uh, somewhere along. It felt like you had the, the, the worst <laughs> hangover you ever had. 
all day and you're kind of, you know, drifting along through the day trying to figure out what you should do. And they had a thing called recreational therapy and I was assigned to it because I was a good patient and good patients got assigned to recreational therapy. You also had to be on the younger side. And one thing we did when it was rainy was we went to a small bowling alley that was on the grounds. It was like one lane or two lanes. It was good, you know, good fun. The trouble was that the automatic pin setup was so that when you bowled the ball down, you knocked all the pins over. Somebody had to jump into the pit and throw it into the machine, and then the machine would set them. You, you didn't have to set them like uh, you did years ago. But so it was like semi-automatic. Well, I went there in the midst of my treatments. <laughs> and, you know, I was barely able to uh, figure out that I knew I was at the bowling alley. And I knew I was, I could throw the ball down the alley. But when it came my turn to jump into the pit and grab the pins and put them in, and of course it was time. I didn't hit anything. It came down when I wanted to come down. So, boy, I was having a hard time getting all those pins in there in time for a setup. Well, the recreation director didn't say anything, but uh, one of my fellow patients came running down to the pit and said, Bob, you know, get out of there. You're going to kill yourself. I said, I'll set the pins for you. And so I went back and just pulled. And the recreation director didn't say anything one way or another, but it, it gives you an idea how we watched out for each other in the hospital. And if I saw somebody with, was having treatments, as I did once, and was trying to, you know, shave, <laughs> and with an electric razor and he just couldn't do it, why, well, I helped him. I want to move on now into some other aspects of my bipolar life. I don't know exactly where I'll go, but I'm thinking about maybe describing my jobs and how being bipolar affected them and how I was lucky enough, is how I would phrase it, to hold a job <laughs> even though I was, was a little on the crazy side. The basic secret was to find jobs that uh, didn't care if you were a little on the crazy side. <laughs>